Welcome to The Spark. I'm Scott Lamar. Coming up later in the program, it's Native Species Day in Pennsylvania. What can we learn today that can maintain a healthy environment? But up front, the Holocaust was the systemic and state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million Jewish men, women, and children by the Nazi regime and its collaborators. The Nazis believed that Germans were racially superior, and they wanted to create a racially pure state. Jews deemed inferior were considered an alien threat to the so-called German racial community. In the 78 years since World War II ended with the defeat of Nazi Germany, there have been many stories told of the murders and atrocities committed against Jews. However, our guest on The Spark today tells one of the most harrowing and graphic. Tova Friedman was born in central Poland in 1939, and she and her family lived under the domination of Nazis for the first six years of her life. She and her parents were eventually sent to concentration camps, and survived. Tova Friedman has written a new book called The Daughter of Auschwitz, My Story of Resilience, Survival, and Hope. Tova Friedman will be speaking at the Harrisburg Jewish Community Center on Monday, June 5th for the Jewish Family Service of Greater Harrisburg. Tova Friedman, it's an honor to have you with us today. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. After reading your book, I don't know if I've ever heard of someone who escaped death so often. How did you come so close but survive? Well, I really think a lot of it was luck because I would hate to think that I was chosen or I was better or whatever while the other million and a half children were murdered. I think it was just luck being the right time, the right place. I can even quote you, for instance, when I got off the cattle car in in Auschwitz, it was a Sunday, could have been a Monday, a Tuesday, but I learned this years later, of course. And apparently the Nazis were Christians and they didn't want to work so much on Sunday. So they only had four crematoriums going and they didn't want to start a fifth one. So they let me in thinking I'll die anyhow, because I'm in Birkenau. Auschwitz Birkenau was only in one purpose, the purpose of, of, of killing people. So again, there was pure luck. Had I come a different day, I wouldn't have been here to tell the story because every child, every single child, I would say 99.9 children were killed as soon as they arrived, unless they were old enough to work. Mm. There are so many stories, and I want to get to as much as we can. But there's one incident in particular and kind of highlights what you just said. You and other children were taken to a gas chamber at Auschwitz, but you came out alive. Right. Can you describe being taken from the building? Another miracle that I don't understand, and we just don't know why. Um we were always given a special breakfast. I knew already that great food for us, great food, which means some kind of a porridge, uh, after which we were dressed in very warm clothes because it was freezing. Well, whatever we had to wear, we each one had something. And we walked to the gas chamber and it, uh, it was a gigantic ante room. And we were told when we get undressed, we should make sure we know where our clothes are. There were hooks all around with numbers above the hooks. So you knew which hook was yours. Of course, I couldn't read, but I, I could memorize the way it looked. And we got undressed and we stayed there freezing for hours and hours and hours naked. And then they told us to go back. I don't know why. You know, there are all kinds of theories. I thought at the time that uh, they had taken the wrong barrack because they were very organized. Another time somebody told me that maybe they have stopped gassing, but the people who who ordered us to go didn't know about it. I, I don't know. And we came back alive. So that's another, I mean, there was a sort of a miracle after miracle for me to make it. When you were led to the gas chamber, your mother saw you being led away with the other children. What did she say, and how did you answer? By the way, how old were you? And this was in 1945, right? 
Auschwitz and a half. I had my sixth birthday in Auschwitz. And I remember the day exactly. But uh, we were, well, she wasn't with me. She was with a women's camp, but they were not far away. They, all the women were there. And I was walking and I heard my name called. You know, I haven't heard my name for a long time because I was a number. And when I said, oh, my mother's voice, she said, where are you going? I said, to the gas chambers. And the women were screaming. And I remember turning to the little girl next to me. We were partners walking two and two. And I said, why are they crying? I thought every Jewish child has to go to the gas chamber. It was just normal, you know, normal. And, and kept walking. You didn't understand what it meant at your age. Did I understand? When you said, answered your mother that uh, you were going to the gas chambers, you said it just kind of like uh, like you were going uh, on a walk or something. I don't forget. Don't forget that I heard about this since the age of two. By the time I was three and four, I knew about Majdanek. I knew about Dachau. I knew about Treblinka. And I knew about Auschwitz because these are the common words used. This is this was the conversation. Who's going to Dachau? Who's who's going to Auschwitz? When are the transports coming? Can we hide? It, it, it was part of our lives. So I I thought that being Jewish and being a child is what happens to people. I just didn't know what being Jewish was, but I knew the word. And I know that this is what happens. The first six years of your life were under Nazi rule. Uh, you were you grew up in what was called a Jewish ghetto in in Poland. Describe your life as a child from what you can remember from two to uh, you before you went to the I, concentration camp. I remember camp. quite a bit because my mother verified then. Not we didn't talk about it after the war, but right then and there, I was. Um, I lived mostly under the table because for many reasons, it was very crowded and I had no place. Physically, I had no place. It was a tiny apartment with a lot of people, some strangers, some we knew. And it was, it was comfortable. It had blankets and my mother fed me there, whatever food we had. And, but I do remember the death of my grandmother. They came in and just took her and shot her. That was the beginning when they decided that all elderly, elderly men over 50 years old were worthless. And then I remember the death of my, of my, uh, uh, my father's parents. I didn't see that. I did see the death of my grandmother. She was shot outside the house, but not of my parents, um, my father's parents. He came in and he told my mother that he just put them on a truck. But I knew where the trucks were going because people talked about it. You know, you live in a crowded situation, mostly adults. And, and, and my mother believed in letting me know what's going on so I, so I could prepare myself for life. And, and um, he, they were, his parents were taken and they were shot. And I knew exactly how because people talked about it. You know, kids listen especially if you've got nothing else to do a whole day. You're starving. You have no toys of any kind. You don't have other children to play with. You listen to the adults. The more I learned the language, I was young, the more I understood, oh, that's what happened. And then they, all the elderly were taken, undressed, naked, and they were uh, positioned, stood by the, by the um, uh, communal grave and shot from the back. And they fell right into the graves. I knew also that my father, uh, Doug, helped dig a grave like that. People from the age of 20s and 30s were the able-bodied people. They dug the graves for their own parents and for their own children. The Germans didn't do that dirty work. There was our own people did it for our own people under duress. Or they would be shot. In the book, you write about your father. Your father was uh, in the ghetto, uh, was one of the Jewish people who was I don't know, kind of a police. Right, he, right. He didn't carry a weapon or anything like that, but had to actually put his parents on the back of a truck knowing exactly. where they were going. Exactly. He knew exactly 
where they were going. He knew they were going to be shot. You know, the policemen, the Jewish policemen had one job uh, to to keep the people from, from the, to keep sort of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, crowd control. They had no guns. And if they didn't do what they were told, they would be shot. In fact, I think my father took somebody's place because the other person was shot. And, and, and that's all they, so sometimes when my father would tell the story that he saw his friends with their children walking to the, to the cattle cars. And if he wanted to take a child, to help carry a child, because there's so many children and some of them even thought they'll have packages. So they were carrying. And when he tried to help, he was hit in the head and he was, came up home all bloody. So they, they were, the Germans used our own people to hurt us as much as possible. Mm. So much more to tell. What a story. And we'll continue our conversation with Tova Friedman in just a moment. You're listening to The Spark on WITF, your home for NPR and discovering all things local. I'm Scott Lamar. guest is Tova Friedman. She's a Holocaust survivor, author of the new book, The Daughter of Auschwitz, My Story of Resilient Survival and Hope. Tova Friedman will be speaking at the Harrisburg Jewish Community Center on Monday, June 5th for the Jewish Family Service of Greater Harrisburg. Your mother was your protector, wasn't she? Absolutely. She was my protector. She was my teacher. Uh, without her, I would, have, of course, not survived. She taught me survival skills. She prepared me to be alone in that kind of a world, which I, I was after they separated us. But she also taught you to hide your emotions, not cry, and you withstood a whole lot by, by doing that. I mean, she taught you well in that way. Well, you know, I knew the consequences because she once took me to a shooting that I could see point blank right in front of me, a per an adult being shot because they didn't obey certain rules. So she taught me to obey the rules and I saw the consequences. And when she said, you better be do this and this or you will die, I obeyed and I learned. And that's how I survived, really. So when were you and your parents taken away and to where? I was 50, I was five and a half. And we were in, in Starchowice, which is a labor camp where the, my parents worked in, in, in an ammunition factory a whole day. And when they just decided to take all the children away, they, had, they took different, different population was killed uh, on time, on their schedule. And now the children's turn came from that camp. Um, for a while I was hidden. Then they just took us all on the on the cattle car, and that's when my parents were separated. And my I and my mother went to Auschwitz. My father went to Dachau. But you all survived. Your mother. We survived. Your... Absolutely, we were all tattooed. My father, you know, the tattooing was only in Auschwitz, no other camp, and I don't know why. So when my father came to to Auschwitz before he he continued his trip to Dachau, he was tattooed, and then I and my my mother were tattooed, and he went into Dachau. And after the war, we we I was with my mother, 
and my father came from der from Germany when when the Americans freed Dachau. You write in the book that uh, there were many people who, when they survived the Holocaust, that they tried to hide their tattoos. And you had people who advised you to hide your tattoo, but you Without write you never did. Without a question. My first person who told me that was in Auschwitz when I was tattooed. The woman who tattooed me told me, you know, if you survive this, you can hide this. You, as she's tattooing me, she's talking to me. And she said, get a long sleeve, you know, long, long sleeve shirt, and nobody would know. That was the first person. The second person was when I came to America, and a wonderful, kind doctor thought it'll give me a gift. I'll take off the tattoo. They won't, you won't even see the scar after a while. I said, no, there is no reason. The third person was my teacher in the eighth grade who said, we don't want to see this. You should, you should cover it up and we don't want to talk about it. And I didn't for many, 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 many years mm. until my own children asked me about it. We're on Zoom right now, and I can't tell if you're wearing a long sleeve. Uh... <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> you want to see it? Sure. I mean, uh, it's, it's kind of odd asking. To... No, I feel that I and Tattoo are sort of partners if, so, if there are deniers that it didn't happen, if they say children could not have survived, whatever it is, this is a witness, the two of us. Mm. It, but, I, but I do understand 100% that people I met took it off because it was easier to forget without it. I can't forget it because I have it with me all the time. When you were liberated, by the way, tell us about that. I mean, you heard rumors that the Russians were coming, correct? Right. Well, and, and all of a sudden, my mother appeared. I've not seen her for a long time. And she, my mother always spoke to me, always the conversations, no matter how old I was. She said, look, the, the Russians are coming, the Germans are running away, and they're taking us with them. I can't walk. And she was really sick. So she said, let's go and hide here. We'll die here, but at least we'll die without running, because she thought she would die on the march. 95, 98% of the people died. In fact, it was referred to as the death march. So she took me and the two of us hid with corpses. Mm. So when the Germans came in to find people to take on the march, we were hidden with dead bodies. How do you do that as a child? How do you do that? Hide? Was, oh, you know what? I always I had I had no fear of a corpse. First, I've seen corpses from the time I remember. Corpses don't hurt you. I mean, corpses can't can't do anything. They they. But this particular corpse was still warm. It was a a, a woman I would say in the twenties, and I I cuddled with that corpse. My mother placed my body in a certain way so there'll be it wouldn't be visible. And I remember thinking. Oh, this poor woman that's died, but she's my protector right now. Without her, I would have died. I would have been killed. Wow. So I only had a very positive feeling towards that. You know, it's, 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 it's a different attitude when you grow up in a different way. When your family, when you and your family returned to your hometown in Poland, you weren't welcomed, were you? Terrible. It was a terror. My mother kept saying, oh, you'll meet such wonderful family from her family. Not a single person came back. Nobody. And when I tried to go to school, the Polish kids would call me uh, a Christ killer and, and, and terrible things. And they threw stones. And I, I refused to. I didn't go to school in Poland. I was here for three years and I refused to enter the school. And, and the neighbors said, what are you doing here? We thought Hitler killed you all. Terrible, terrible reception. Mm. The anti-Semitism is just in, in, incredible that you talk about. So when did the family come to America? Uh, 19, 15, April 4th, I know exactly. 1950, we arrived to New York City. Mm. But you always wanted to go to Israel after 1948. In fact, you lived there for years. What was life like in Israel? Fabulous. I tell you, it was it was like, you know, 
for the first time you look at soldiers with guns and you love them and you make a prayer for their success to feel to live in a country where there's no anti-semitism and that you all like it was like 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 having the family that was killed in europe why'd you come back oh it had to do uh, with the jobs mm. my my husband there was a problem in israel f financially for the whole country had a had a i'm thinking in hebrew now a uh, recession that's the word so we he came here and it just kids got involved you know this one got a boyfriend this one <laughs> wanted to finish high school and it just started but we go to israel all the time you became you became a therapist yes in israel i taught at the hebrew university in america i came back 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 to school became a therapist and i love 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 jewish family service mm. We only have a minute or so left, and I mean, there is so much. You have such a fascinating story, and uh, I mean, I've been on the verge of tears a couple times just listening to your your story. Uh, what do you want people who hear or read your story to know? I want to tell them that if we do not control our hatred or suspicion of others, the world will only have another catastrophe we cause our own catastrophes and we be through through fear of some, of people we don't know like hitler thought that we were worms and not worth anything not only we but you know the 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 uh, the gypsies the, the roman the uh, the 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 gays the uh, uh, that that only certain people are allowed to be on this earth we got to be careful of that because right now there's anti-Semitism. It's sort of, again, the question, why are we against people that are different than we are? And I want to, I feel like I am almost like, like calling about the danger. Watch, don't do that. The hatred is terrible towards each other now. Mm. So I, to I, I would like to, Tova Freeman. I, I hope it's a warning, it's a warning. Tova Friedman, as I said earlier, it's an honor speaking with you today. Your book is The Daughter of Auschwitz, My Story of Resilience, Survival, and Hope. You'll be speaking at the Harrisburg Jewish Community Center on uh, June 5th for the Jewish Family Service of Greater Harrisburg. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you.